Good afternoon and welcome to the 11th Nathaniel Litchfield Lecture, um, sponsored by Dahlia Litchfield Dynamic Planning. It's fantastic to be here in the great city of Sheffield for today's lecture. Um, before we start, uh, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm chairing the lecture today uh, and I'll be fielding questions for Professor Philip uh, at the end of the presentation. So if you have questions, please put them in the question and answer box. Should something awful happen, like you drop off the platform, just log back in again, you'll be fine, it's fine. So that's all the housekeeping you need to know. Um, I just want to say a few words before we start. I think it's fantastic that this series of lectures always seems to me to be the finger on the pulse of what needs to be discussed in the coming year. So if you recall, last year we were talking about health and well-being just as we were emerging from the pandemic. And that's an issue that's not going to go away. But levelling up is now coming front and centre into our focus as we emerge from the pandemic. And it's a really important time to be talking about it and talking about it in the north, in Sheffield today. I think we've seen that there are all too many economic disparities within the UK and it is the work of government to try and resolve some of these tricky and when I worked in local government people said to me the wicked issues you know some of those things that are very difficult to solve and how can planning help to solve some of that small autobiographical note I'm from the northeast those people who uh, know me from the northeast RTPI will know that I've been passionate for a long time about tackling inequalities in our towns and cities health and well-being and also climate change Get all those things right, put them all together, and you've got a fantastic place to live. Get them wrong, and the problems just seem to get worse and worse. So, this afternoon I'd like to introduce you to Professor Philip McCann, Professor of <laughs> Urban and Regional Economics at the University of Sheffield. Professor Philip is an advisor to the OECD, the European Investment Bank and numerous different governments across Europe and beyond, I suspect. So, I give you Professor Philip. Well, firstly, um, thank you very much, Timothy, for, for introducing me and thank you to the RTPI. It's a real honour to be invited to give this lecture. Um, you know, it's a very prestigious lecture, so I, I'm really really, really delighted to be part of this uh, series. Now, I'm, I'm Professor of Urban and Regional Economics, so I, I discuss the behaviour and performance of cities and regions in the UK and in many, many countries, uh, primarily from an economics perspective, but I also um, integrate different ways of thinking, and planning is one of the big areas which informs a lot of my thinking, I'll refer to this. Um, what I'm going to try and do today is I'm going to talk about the levelling up issue. Levelling up for those of you who are uh, logging in from outside of the UK is really about interregional convergence. It's trying to improve the, the prosperity of the weaker regions in the UK. It's become a huge political issue, as Timothy just said. It's really front and centre. So I'm going to try and talk about it, but I'm going to try and um, articulate certain issues that are not really talked about in the press or in the media um, or even in much of the academic world, which I think are really central. So let me kind of go through some of the issues. Back in 2012 and 2013, The Spectator, a magazine called The Spectator, and The Economist, also a well-known international magazine, published a few reports that I thought really well captured what was taking place in the UK at the time. That the UK was starting to partition on many levels. If you look at the economic geography of the UK, the different regions, broadly the south versus the north, but it's much more complicated than that. We know that. But broadly, the country had been partitioning economically and these articles explain this in terms of what is the political economy. And one of these articles was written by Neil O'Brien, the MP for Harborough, who's now the Under Secretary of State um, leading on the levelling up work within the, uh, the team putting together the white paper. And the argument here is that as countries start to partition economically, it becomes much more difficult to govern them. They're much more fragmented. People have very different views and perceptions and preferences, and it's much more difficult to coordinate a lot of activities. The economist's take on this was to argue that the UK was starting to become 
as if the geography of the UK was partitioned between the two codes of rugby, rugby union and rugby league. Rugby league being primarily in the north, rugby union being primarily in the south. But the argument from the economist was not simply geographical. It was, it was more subtle than that. He said the point is, if you look at the different codes of rugby, to an outsider from another country, they look exactly the same game. You have an egg-shaped ball, you run forward, you pass the ball backwards, you fall over onto the ground to score a try, and then you kick it between a, a set of posts that are shaped like an H. But for people who play rugby, they know that they're fundamentally different. They have completely different histories. The rules are different, the training systems are different, the number of players are different, the refereeing systems are different, and then all the external business and culture, investments, all the communities of practice associated with those games, all the marketing, sales, everything is different and they barely cross over. In fact, there's so few players cross over that we can name most of them. And that, I thought, would really capture the nature of the problem, that the partitioning of the country into these different components actually makes the country much more difficult to govern. So this is fundamentally about institutional types of issues. So in the past, people talked about rebalancing. Now we talk about leveling up. It's the same kind of narrative about trying to, trying to correct for these imbalances. So that's the central issue. Fundamentally, what I've been arguing is that what's happened in the UK is a combination of three things. One is our geography, two is the effects of globalization on the different parts of the country, and three is the question of governance, three Gs. I've written a very long book on it, 570 pages, trying to explain the nature of the problem. And I've written also about the perceptions uh, that people have, the so-called geography of discontent. People in so-called left behind places feel very angry and very aggrieved, and you know, with, with real justification. But that also puts pressure on our institutional systems, our governance systems, and our political systems. So this is, this is about economics, but it's about politics, it's about sociology, culture, identity, all of these things are in there, and of course environment. But I'm going to argue that still fundamentally I always come back to the economic issues. Famous quote by Nobel Prize winning economist Paul Krugman, that productivity isn't everything, it's just in the long run, it's almost everything. That is a principle that still holds. Low productivity places are poor places on almost every dimension. High productivity places are prosperous places on almost every dimension. And this goes well beyond economics. This also has many, many dimensions way beyond that. And I'll highlight a few of those in a moment. But an important point in the UK is a lot of the narratives that we have in the media and also in politics about levelling up, about inequalities across regions, across jobs. differences in terms of those inter-regional inequalities are fairly even, as in inter-regional inequalities and intra-regional inequalities. The difference is at a very local level, within towns, within cities, between neighbourhoods. In the case of a country which is very even inter-regionally, small countries such as the Netherlands, Finland or New Zealand, or even huge countries like Japan, almost all the spatial differences are localised, they're very local, they're not inter-regional. The UK is at the other end of the spectrum, that we have very high intra-regional inequalities, we have very high intra-urban inequalities and inter-urban inequalities, as I'll show you in a few moments, and we also have very high inter-regional inequalities. And the reason that's important is because the inter-regional inequalities are the most difficult to deal with. And there, the, the kind of inequalities where proper strategic thinking regarding planning types of issues becomes absolutely critical. They're not things that can be handled entirely at the local level. Thirdly, in the UK, our inequalities are not about big cities versus everywhere else. This is true in countries such as the United States, Canada, Australia, to a smaller extent, the Republic of Ireland, New Zealand, but it's not a story of the UK. It's not about big cities versus small places. It's not about metropolitan elites versus people who are local. That is not the economics of levelling up in the UK. And that is where we are different. The UK has what's called a core periphery problem. The core periphery structure are the prosperous parts of the country, primarily in the south, 
but as I've said, it's more nuanced than that, versus the periphery most other places. That's the nature of the problem. And the differences between different types of cities and towns, or small towns and rural areas, or big cities, those differences in the UK are amongst the smallest in the industrialized world. So it's not a big city story that we often hear. And part of this is also reflected in terms of the economics of these places. There's increasing evidence that places are separating into what economists call, particularly trade economists, places which produce tradables versus non-tradables. Tradables are the goods and services which can be exported, both across regions and also particularly across countries, versus the productions of goods and services which are primarily for only for local consumption, local production and local consumption. Now, on many levels, there are people who will favour local production for local consumption for environmental reasons, quality, variety, and so on. But the problem is economically that there is a danger that places get caught in a trap, an economic trap. So that's a difficult problem. So just to give you a flavour of the inequalities in the UK, about half the UK population today live in areas whose productivity, which is the best measure of overall prosperity, is about the same level as the poorer parts of the former East Germany. It's no better than that. It's similar to many parts now of Central and Eastern Europe that were formerly under the communist regime. That's the reality of about half the population in the UK. With a quality of life and multi-dimensional living standards about the same as the US state of Alabama, which is one of the poorest states in the United States. We have regions in the UK that have huge divergences in, in life expectancy, longevity. I mean, the difference is even amongst the poorest groups, the poorest income groups in the UK, between the most prosperous regions and the poor, poorest regions, would be the, about the equivalent of the difference between the UK and North Africa. These are profound differences, and they, 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 they emerge from the economic inequalities which have emerged over, over the last four, four decades, more or less. And they become intergenerational as well. So they become really wicked problems, as Timothy sees them for X, which is correct. Also, we've seen things like civic engagement. The scores in the UK are very low. Most of civic engagement uh, scores in the UK are in the bottom half of the OECD. There's only a small number of places in the top areas. And again, they're the most prosperous places. And you also see a huge concentration of funding, particularly government-related funding, research-related funding, in areas like heritage, culture, arts, all of these things have become hugely centralised in the last 20 or 30 years. And yet these are the things that make up the fabric of life in different places, and many places feel starved of these activities and engagements. Well, it's true. You know, people see what's happening. The final point is local government. In the UK, local government today has the level of authority and autonomy about the same as a country like Slovakia. We have amongst the lowest levels of local government authority and autonomy in the industrialized world. We are one of the world's most highly centralized societies in terms of governance. Very, very top down. So we tend to think in terms of one size fits all policies. We have a national policy for this, a national policy for that. But the problem is inside the country is becoming so different. <coughs> Excuse me, can I get a glass of water? Sorry about that. Um, the country is becoming so different that if you have national policies for everything, but the country internally is partitioning, it becomes more and more difficult to govern the country. Even if you have a well-designed policy, the chance of it working in all parts of the country is very limited. In fact, it's falling as the country is becoming more different internally. So, a difficulty here is a lot of the discussions that we have about levelling up, that type of issue, in the press are often not very accurate. They are rather misguided. It's not intentional, it's just that this is a really, really difficult topic. And understanding the data and evidence is not easy. As I say, it took me 570 pages to explain this. It's extremely complicated. Um, the exceptions here would be the Financial Times and The Economist, who really covered and articulated these, these issues very, very well. But most of the media has been a long way behind where I would certainly want them to be. The, the best description of the UK was by Andy Haldane, former Chief Economist of the Bank of England, who's now Permanent Secretary, heading up the whole levelling up agenda, which is great news, this appointment, working alongside Neil O'Brien, and soon to be also, he'll, he'll become the, the head of the 
Royal Society for Arts. And his description of the UK's economy is a hub with no spokes. And I think that's a very, very good way of capturing what the core issue is. So we've got a whole series of things going on. Um, you know, we've got narratives, political narratives that don't necessarily relate to the, re to the realities. We look different to many other countries. Um, it's often hard to make comparisons between the UK and other countries, but there are areas where you can make comparisons. I'm going to show you one of them now. So, but just to give you a flavor of these inequalities, look at the comparison between the UK and Germany. So the fixed lines, the hard lines are the UK, and these are measured, these are different measurements of national accounts. And what you see is over time, the dotted lines are Germany, and they're measures of interregional inequality. So over the last two or three decades, since German reunification, Germany was much more unequal than the UK immediately after reunification in 1990. But since then, Germany's become more and more equal. And the UK's become more and more unequal at exactly the same time, so they've crossed into a kind of an X shape. So today, the UK is more interregionally unequal than Germany was at the time of reunification when West Germany effectively absorbed East Germany. And there's lots of indicators of this, and I, I'll just, I can just flip through. But this X shape, this crossing pattern, is pretty much evident whichever indicator you use. Now this is important because it tells you that the trajectory, the trajectory that we've experienced in the UK over the last three or four decades is not automatic. It's not been the experience of other countries, it's been the experience of some other countries, but not all. Different countries have had different experiences, and also because they've responded to these things politically and in terms of governance in many different ways. Germany made an explicit decision to integrate, to equalize, to level up. And the German state has been investing about 70 billion euros per annum for 30 years in leveling up. So think about the order of magnitude of what we're talking about, approximately 70 billion. And Germany's a country with, you know, they're a little bit bigger than the UK, but similar population density, similar sizes of cities, and so on. They're not massively different to us. The difference is they don't have a core periphery structure. They're very evenly balanced across the countries, different industries, different uh, business services, different competences, and so on. And just finally, the point about cities themselves. As I say, a lot of people think there's a big city versus the rest story in the UK. All the data from the Office for National Statistics, the OECD, just tells us that's simply not true. In fact, it's less true in the UK than almost any other industrialized country. What we have are also, because we have this core periphery problem interregionally, we have huge inequalities also between cities in the UK. We have very, very prosperous cities, many of which are large, and we also have very poor cities, many of which are large, and we also have very prosperous small cities and also very poor small cities. And you can see over time, if I just highlight here, you can see that the UK, these are measures of inequality between cities. And they're very, very high by international standards. Very, very high. And on some indicators, they're just growing and growing and growing. But the point is, we don't have a city versus everyone else story. We often see it in the press, it's simply not true. So it's important to understand that we have huge differences between regions, between localities, and also between cities. That's the kind of, the kind of benchmark that we have to work from. And of course, all of this leveling up challenge now is overlaid by the effects of the global financial crisis, Brexit, and of course the COVID-19 pandemic. So we've got these huge societal shocks which are going to be impacting on all of our cities and regions in different ways. So the leveling up agenda is becoming even more challenging than it was um, maybe 5, 10, 15 years ago. It's increasingly becoming more challenging, but the good news is, it's, it's as exact, exactly as Timothy said, it's front and centre now. It's squarely right in the middle of all political debate. So that's extremely important. Now, one of the areas where there isn't a lot talked about. Obviously, in this kind of RTPI environment, talking about land markets and planning is central to how everybody here thinks, but that is not central to how journalists talk about this stuff. You know, it's very, very rare you'll see a serious piece of analysis. Some very good stuff in the FT and The Economist, particularly the FT, on these issues. But mainstream media, beyond that, very hard you'll find anything. It's also difficult, actually, in terms of the academic world. A lot of people don't talk about these issues either, but I think they're absolutely central. 
Central for several reasons. Firstly, places need to look good and to feel nice. Investors act on gut instinct, and when places look good and they feel nice, investors think, I could be interested in this place. Also, workers, and particularly skilled workers who are thinking about setting down roots, having a family, whatever it might be, if a place is a nice environment with great retail offerings, super shops, cafes, beautiful heritage, great transportation, good living environment, easy mobility, and safe, of course, people think, actually, this is a place I could come and live and work. This is critical because places need to attract high human capital. That is absolutely important. You've got to have people with skills to invest in industries, to bring their skills and competences and technologies to bear in the local economy. And you also need the investors to be interested in the place thinking, I'm interested in putting money here. So that's part of the story. Places need to look good and feel good in order for investors to be interested. That's the bottom line and everybody knows that. The second part of the story is also a much little known, much less known issue, is that real estate is the most important form of collateral for entrepreneurs, the people who drive the technological changes in the economy. It's the entrepreneurs who are the risk takers, the investors, and they're the guys that drive innovation. And real estate is by far the most important form of collateral for getting credit from banks to get those businesses moving. Those really you know, startups, which are going to drive technological changes to change the local industrial environment, the local industrial fabric. Those people, you, know, you need the right skills, you need the right technologies, but you also need the finance. And real estate is critical. So real estate has two fundamental aspects to it. It's about changing the nature of a place and also changing the nature of a place as far as investors are concerned and banks, finance houses. It's two sides to the same coin but both are critical. And I think that often we miss this when we talk about leveling up type issues, that kind of financial type discussion. It's sort of floating around in the background, but it's not too explicit. So I'm going to show you an example of a shock. So one of the things that I'm trying to articulate has happened in a lot of industrialized economies, including the UK, since the global financial crisis is that the way that our different regions function in terms of financial markets has changed fun fundamentally. And this is a part of the leveling up discussion that we need to think about very carefully. So, you know, real estate wealth is about 80% of all wealth. And by far the biggest form of business collateral for small, medium sized entrepreneurs to get, you know, new ideas, new technologies going locally. So it's a critical part of the industrial ecosystem. But real estate is also extremely important because it links short-term investments with medium-term and long-term decision-making. Real estate investments tend to be big. They are fixed. They're not short-term. You know, they are physically fixed. And they tend to bundle together both short and medium and long-term investment flows. So real estate investments brings together different forms of money markets into a place. So it's a critical market it's a critical marker of how the markets think about the economy of a locality. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at some capital pricing data. Now, some of you will be familiar with this literature, many of you won't, it doesn't matter. It's just to understand the basic point, the basic principle. So this is looking at evidence from the United States. I can tell you the research team I'm part of that we're doing this, the results for the UK look fairly pretty much the same. We're working on UK and European investment data at the moment. The results change a bit, but not fundamentally. But I'm going to show you the US case because it, it tells us a lot about what's also happened in the UK. So we have uniquely detailed data sets from the uh, United States. And what we have is individual buildings. So it's every investment in a building of over two and a half million dollars over a 20 year period across the US. What we have is very, very detailed data. We know the block, not just the zip code, but we know the actual block the building is in, we know how many people are working there in the building, we know what kind of activities they're doing, we know all the data about the cities, the city productivity, all the economic characteristics of the city, and the actual transaction that purchased the building and then on leased all the, the, the real estate space in the building to residential customers, commercial, industrial, whatever it is, we know the price of the transaction, we know the yield values, that's the, the risk rate return profile, and then we know all the characteristics of the building as well. And we're able to model all of these things. So, how, what do we do? 
Well, we're building argument about around a very simple principle that some of you will be familiar with in your university days, something called Zipp's Law. And what you can do is you can plot the natural log of the rank of a city. So the rank one is always the biggest city. So in the UK, rank one is London, rank two is Manchester, rank three is Birmingham, and so on. You can do that across every country. You can do it across country, continents even. So you have the log of the rank of the city, and you can plot it against the natural log of the population of the city. London would be 9.5 million, Manchester would be 3.2 million, and so on. And what you see across uh, most countries is that that relationship has a curious property to it. It has a particular slope. It's a slope of minus 1. But the point is that the way that cities are structured in terms of size distributions has a regularity to it. It's an observed regularity in multiple countries in multiple time periods. And what does that regularity mean? it means that the growth rate of any city is random. It is not that bigger cities automatically grow faster than smaller cities, nor do smaller cities grow faster than bigger cities. The growth rates are randomly distributed. And actually, there's overwhelming evidence that this is the case in most situations. So this is, this is the principle we're going to work from. And the way we do is we, we, map, we map the clusters in different types of cities. So these are three examples. New York in the top left, top right is San Francisco, San Jose, the bottom is, is, is Los Angeles. New York is a very monocentric city. It has two main clusters right in the center, downtown and midtown, which are very close to each other. And the rest of the city is primarily residential. Most economic activity is right in the center. Whereas San Francisco, San Jose is a series of dispersed clusters going right the way through Silicon Valley. And Los Angeles is a series of lots of dispersed clusters. The city structures are different, and that's important because of the pricing. What we can do is we can plot the risk-return profile of all of these investments in individual, um, individual real estate, and we can aggregate them city by city for every city in the United States. And what you see is this. The risk-return profile is approximately normally distributed, which is what you would expect. But the risk-return profile for investments inside clusters, inside cities, systematically has a lower risk profile than investments outside of those clusters. Because investors think, hang on, if there's lots of business activities of that type clustered in the same place, it's a safer place to invest. Whereas if there's very few places locally in that sector, it's much more risky. And you actually see it almost perfectly in the distribution of what we call the yields, which is the risk return pricing characteristics. If we compare New York, which is very monocentric, those differences are very significant. You're either in the center or you're outside. They're different worlds economically. Whereas in Los Angeles over here, because Los Angeles is so fragmented, there's not really any difference. It doesn't matter whether you're in a particular cluster or not. So this is important. It tells us the geography of the city including inside the city, is really important in terms of how financial markets think about the city. And indeed, we can plot this so-called Zips law relationship. We can plot it for cities, and we can plot it even more accurately for individual business clusters across all the cities of the United States. As I say, we've already been doing this for the UK and for the rest of Europe as well. You get more or less the same structure. So the important thing is that the structure of cities and the business clusters inside them actually has a financial analog. How the financial markets think about that place is explicitly articulated in the pricing of investments into those, not only the cities, but the clusters inside the cities. And then what we do is we look at the difference between the cities and the clusters in the period before the global financial crisis and after the global financial crisis. This is the important point. If you look at the top, upper top left-hand quadrant, what we see is that the yield values, the average yield values, which is the risk-return pricing ratio, for each cluster across all of the US cities is independent of the size of the city. So the horizontal axis is the log of the rank. The higher value of the rank means a smaller city. And what we see is the pricing is an exactly horizontal line. 
In other words, the risk return profile of cities is completely independent of the size of the city. That is correct according to Zipp's law. And we get the result beautifully. We get exactly the correct result. But what's interesting is, after the global financial crisis, that is no longer true. The line starts to slope upwards. What does it mean? How do we think about it? What it means is, before the global financial crisis, the markets, financial markets globally were kind of working, as you would expect from a textbook. This would be undergraduate real estate finance course 101 capital asset pricing model, right? And it works beautifully. After the global financial crisis, it starts to break down. That investors start to become more nervous about places which are smaller or less prosperous. And what do they start doing is, they start taking money out and investing it in the more expensive, more prosperous places. That's the story. This is what happened. And we see this in different ways. We can plot the risk return profile according to rates of return over free markets, government treasury bills for example, risk free. You can do it if you multiply by kind of risk return profiles on top of treasury bills, US government debt and so on. All these different relationships. If we do it before the global financial crisis, everything kind of looked correct according to a textbook. But after the global financial crisis, all of these pricing relationships start to collapse. What you get is huge spreads in all of these yield distributions. They should look something like a normal distribution. And they start flattening and spreading out. What this tells us is, instead of everything being equal, in terms of risk return profiles, as it was before the global financial crisis, that investors suddenly can't price things properly. They start to become scared. And what you get is this explosion in these yield values. And you see it here. This is the clustering of all the pricing. And it's approximately correct according to a textbook. You get a slope that looks like this. But what happens after the global financial crisis is these yield spreads just start to explode. They're almost unrelated to the cities beforehand. What does that mean? Well, we can do exactly the same thing, not just at the cluster level, but at the cities as a whole. You, you see exactly the same results as we go through. You see this huge spread effect over here, the widening of all these yields. What does it mean? What happened is this, that investors at the time of the global financial crisis started to panic because they see that the origin of the crisis was in the real estate markets. They start taking money out of places which are economically weaker or smaller or a combination of both. And they start taking that money out and putting it into the big cities, which are the more prosperous ones. In other words, cities become an extension of the global bond market. And so suddenly, if you're in Seattle or Boston post-crisis, actually, it's pretty good news because there's credit collect, there's credit pouring into your cities. Not just the relative shares, but the absolute shares of credit are increasing. You've got credit pouring into the city at bargain basement prices. And if you are real estate owners in the city, land markets are shooting up. The price of land, and of course, if you've got quantitative easing on top of this, it's even accelerating the process. So your collateral positions are improving all the time. Whereas if you're in Akron, Ohio, for example, the opposite is happening. Credit is being pulled out of the city at a tremendous rate. The price of credit is increasing and anyone with real estate collateral in the local economy, their positions are deteriorating. So what you get is a partitioning. And you see it also, this is another measure of this partitioning. What you see is these are called cluster level beta values. And what you see is a kink here. It shoots upward. What it means is that the businesses become much more confident and responsive to putting money into the big cities which are already prosperous and taking it out of all the other places. What this tells us is the global financial crisis was also a huge capital shock to different types of cities. Different cities and different regions actually experienced complete different partitioning in terms of how the financial markets thought about them. And you see this in terms of indicators of inequality across US cities and regions. That you had all these years of leveling up, convergence as economists call it, we had 60 years of interregional convergence in the United States, suddenly became dramatically interregional divergence. 
The standard explanation for this has always been about trade with China. But we know that the effect in the US cities of trade with China had dissipated by 2007. This is all post that. And what we see is the capital markets are a key part of the story. So in terms of the, the US city, kind of the experience, what, can, what does that help us to come back to think about the leveling up issues in the UK? Well, the first thing is that the standard characteristics of cities in terms of diversity, scale, and so on, when the markets are working well, doesn't play a great deal of effect. The markets are able to price most things. You get fairly even risk return profiles. But when you start to get uncertainty, the markets are being ch uh, challenged by these big systemic shocks, then the situation changes dramatically. And the nature of a place, the structure of it, the diversity of a city, the size of the city really starts to have a huge effect. And then you get this big partitioning between the places which are large and prosperous and other places. That is what we see. What's also important is I can tell you from our data that we've already worked on, we haven't published this yet, but we'll be doing this to, uh, later on this next year, you see the same stories in the United Kingdom and across the whole of Europe. So this partitioning effect of the capital markets. Why is this important? From my point of view, because these issues about finance and local development are rarely talked about in the leveling up debates. They have huge implications in terms of how cities grow, how regions develop, how entrepreneurs can start businesses locally, all of that. They also have implications in terms of when we talk about devolution, fiscal forms of devolution, whether it's business rate retention or whatever it might be. Anything that changes the financial or the fiscal balance of a locality, those implications can be very complicated and we need a lot more discussion about these things. At the moment, they're treated in a very kind of marginal or almost cursory manner. We talk about powers and rules and laws, but we don't talk too much about what are the financial and fiscal implications of those changes. And the connection, of course, is if local government is involved in public-private partnerships, then how private markets price capital in cities heavily affects the financial and the fiscal position also of subnational, subcentral government bodies. Um, and so I, th I think I'll stop there. I think hopefully I've given you a flavour of a series of things that people haven't really been thinking about, which I think there needs to be a lot more discussion about. I'll leave it there, shall I? Great. Thank you very much, Philip. Um, fantastic. Really stimulating. <laughs> We've had a good number of questions. And I suppose, I suppose it's a comment from me. It's reassuring as a planner to know that investment's in place. I love that look good, feel nice thing. Because actually that's kind of what you get out of bed for, isn't it? Knowing somehow that faith that this is going to make the difference and that people will be attracted to come and invest in your place. And it's true. You know, at a certain time of life, you want to pick somewhere that is going to give you a good life. It's, it's relatively straightforward stuff. But to have it de described in detail about what the, you know, how economics is actually the thing under the hood that we don't look at is absolutely central, I think, to the debate in terms of how we go forward and get great places, because it's oh, it's, uh, this engine room is, is kind of part of it. So we've, we've, had, we've had some questions in, which is great. Um, well, the votes, one of them, the first question is more of a comment, but I'm still going to ask it. So uh, Nigel Smith says, uh, hello Nigel, um, getting rid of the regional spatial strategies was certainly a big step in the wrong direction. I was going to say after that, discuss. Um, well, I can answer that with my next slide. Oh. If I go down, I don't know if you can see it, because actually what I was going to refer to, I just jumped down. I was going to suggest, I think, two of the most important initiatives and documents that need to be part of the discussion are the UK 2070 Commission documents and the One Powerhouse Consortium documents. This is exactly the point. The point about inter-regional, that's the difficult challenge in the UK, because local government is too small to affect that. It has to be a partnership between local and national. And the regional MISO level governments, where planning plays such an important role in terms of spatial strategies, thinking strategically, how we're going to facilitate and plan for those changes, seem to kind of basically disappear once we, once we lost the regional spatial strategy. It's very, very localised and much more ad hoc. But the challenges we're facing after the global financial crisis, the Brexit, now the, the pandemic, these are big changes to our economy and society. And we have to think 
large scale strategic regional as well as very local and neighborhood level and you know, I, I agree entirely I agree entirely right so I think that answers the question Nigel's question there um, I'm not supposed to put my view forward but I entirely agree so <laughs> as far as I can see it's, it's important that we're thinking at the right scale yeah. and there's no point in having endless amounts of money to invest if you don't know where you're going to invest it and have a plan behind it so I guess yeah. I guess you'd agree with that. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. Lovely. Thank you. Um, we have another question now from Andrew Trigger. How does the inequality gap between northern and southern England, or slash northern Stoke Southern, compare with other UK nations? Does the devolution model present an opportunity for improved governance in England? Well, I think I think you can you can respond to that question you can keep on various different levels. Um, the more localised, the, the smaller the units you use to measure things spatially in terms of regional inequalities, that in general those variations increase. So you have to use kind of similar levels in order to measure inequality. So if you me measure inequality by looking at very lots of you know, huge numbers of very small neighbourhoods, you'll get a much bigger score than if you look at a small number of very large regions. So part of the difference is the question about comparability. But inequalities in the UK are fairly typical across most places, particularly outside of the wider South. You see, the South of England broadly kind of functions like a textbook model would tell you that the biggest cities outperform in terms of productivity, the, the larger cities outperform the medium cities, the medium cities out, outperform the smaller town, cities and towns, the big towns outperform the small towns, and they all outperform the rural areas. But because they have that ordering, it also means everywhere is more prosperous. The other parts of the UK, what you see is that there's very little difference in productivity performance between the big places and the small places. And the effect of that is everybody is lowered. And the way I try to explain it when I'm talking to students is, imagine a tablecloth on a table. You pick the middle of the tablecloth up in the middle. And what you see is these, the tablecloth falls away very dramatically, but it's still higher due to the fact that you've picked it up. The problem in many parts of the country is there isn't enough energy and pressure or, or lift pulling the tablecloth up. And that's a big problem in the UK. It's the underperformance of many of our big cities relative to peer, peer group comparators in the rest of Europe or the OECD. And I think, I think some of the graphs that you showed us, I think it was that, you see that played out, don't you, in, some, in a town near you, <laughs> that this, this whole equation between sort of land value and property and everything gets, gets played out in front of your very eyes. And I think it's been very revealing to see what the underlying kind of mechanism almost is to kind of uh, bring some sense to that, because at least then we can think about the intervention, I guess. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Absolutely. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, right, another question here. This is from Jed Griffiths. Hello, Jed. Um, what are your views on English regional government? Would this be part of a solution? So that's taking the devo thing a bit further. In a, taking the devolution arguments in a different direction. Well, I tend not to use the word government. I always use the word governance because governance can have many different formats. So if you think, for example, the New York plan, which is the, the joint effort between the New York Connecticut, New Jersey, this gigantic city region of more than 20 million people. It's not a government authority, it's actually effectively a gigantic NGO. It's independent, but stakeholders from all levels of government and private sector and civil society are part of that process. So you can do things without it being government. It's about what is the right governance. And equally, it's a very local level. Uh, local governments often are hugely enhanced by working with civil society organizations. They're not officially or part of government, they're part of the governance process. So it's about trying to get the governance process correct. And I think the difficulty in the UK is the missing level of MISO governance. That we go from very local to central, except in the devolved administrations. So the, the gaps are too big. It maximizes the degrees of separation between citizens and central government. And so you know, there's two solutions. Small countries solve it by being small and large countries solve it by decentralizing and devolving into kind of federal states or quasi-federal states. And even the large unitary states like Japan and, Ch and um, France have been devolving for the last 30 years, heavily devolving down to kind of two, three, four million, those kind of spatial units in terms of high-level decision-making, 
pushing down from the centre, consolidating up but also pushing down from the centre. The UK doesn't need to consolidate up because our very local government is actually quite large. It's just tiny relative to the population. And so anything which can enhance uh, region-wide governance, working with central government and also local government, seems to me to be a good thing. Okay, that's great. It's not a question on here, but it's one that follows on from that. Because you mentioned Germany. Yeah. And I, I look at this, so like many people do. If you're an urban designer, you're always showing pictures of somewhere else. You know, yes. you know, look what they're doing in the Netherlands, or look what Germany's doing. But, um, I mean, certainly, is there, any, is there any headlines you feel we could learn from Germany in terms of actions for us in our daily lives, like this month, you know? Like, if we were starting to champion stuff out there, what could we learn from Germany that would be almost? Well, I think, I mean, Germany is a very, very good case to look at. Because for a start, they've done levelling up, and they've done it at scale, and they've done it seriously over time. So, you know, they've developed a series of policies and programmes, and they've They've invested in them and they've kept going, independent of who's in power at the central level or at a uh, state level, the lender level. That's the first point, that they've done it. Secondly, also devolved governance tends to be associated with more equal economic growth within a country. So countries in general which are more devolved in terms of power and decision making tend to grow more evenly. We know that from OECD wide evidence. Whereas countries which are very centralized and top down tend to grow more unevenly, primarily in favor of the capital city region. So part of it is about good governance is, is that, you know, Germany's an example of where you can build, you can build capacity institutions. They had to do that, of course, in the former East Germany. In addition, German cities also have been very proactive around kind of developing a turnaround process. Cities like Dortmund or Duisburg in the Ruhrgebiet, for example. Um, working with the lender, the local banking system, the Sparkassen and the Landers Bank, and they've had a much more integrated approach to helping cities turn around. And of course, land use planning has been absolutely central to how they've done this. You look across the rural cities, for example, coordination across land use planning, transportation systems, all of that, everything's been done at scale on the basis of clear strategies that everybody understands. And it's that long-term commitment, isn't it? So I, I, I persistently the Royal Valley for Tees Valley and say, well, look what the Royal Valley have done with their industrial heritage and turned that into a, an asset, you know, sure. and I think there's there's so much to learn from that, which is, you know, that confluence of green infrastructure as well, which seems to be part of that message as well. Absolutely. Know, laid out. That's really good. Okay, cool. Uh, Nigel McCurdy says, so is the objective equity across the UK, brackets, accepting regional priorities, or a higher game of levelling up with competitor markets in other countries, and critically, what key factors give us best socio-economic advantage so we can plan for them? Well, to me, the two things are interrelated. If you go back you know, 20 years, even 10 or 15 years, but, but certainly 20 years and so on, across many areas of economics, both academic economics, but also institutionally, government, and so on, there was a in many areas there would be, well I'm going to say an implicit assumption, sometimes it was quite explicit, but an implicit assumption that there's a natural trade-off between equity and efficiency. So, you know, we want to promote national growth, of course you're going to have inequalities because, you know, the more prosperous places will grow faster. Well actually we know now that that's not true, for a start because of these kind of Zips law relationships tell us it's much more complicated than and secondly, when we look at the evidence across countries, across the OECD countries, there isn't any particular pattern. Countries which are more devolved tend to grow more evenly internally. We know that that's the case. But not with any loss of capability in terms of growth vis-a-vis -vis more centralised countries. There's no, there's no patterns of those relationships. So the, the local growth dynamics across regions and the national one are not independent of each other. So if you have more more balanced growth internally, more levelling up, it doesn't mean to say that there's a cost implication nationally in terms of foregone growth, lost growth. There's no evidence of that at all. Right. So what we've got is a combination of very mediocre growth com combined with, you know, burgeoning, burgeoning inequalities, and that's not a combination that anyone wants. So, so the local versus national is, 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 you know, they are interrelated. And the other part is also that where you've got parts of the country which are very prosperous, the more you've got places which are lagging behind, they act as a drag on the overall economic scores. So what you get is areas that look very prosperous, 
and quite close by are places which are clearly struggling. The net effect nationally then in the UK is tended to cancel out because those two halves of the economy, the econ I mean, I've written a lot on this, and The Economist actually had an article about the two halves of the UK, they effectively cancel each other out because they're almost the same size right. in terms of population. Yeah, yeah which is it's kind of what you see played out in, in it's not really towns that I certainly know of as well, and, and the look of the draw on which side of the tracks literally you, yeah. you start your life, you know, so yeah. Um, there's another question that's come up. This devolution thing is really quite a big issue, I think. So, Jack Cargos says, what explains England's reluctance to devolve? I have no idea. I mean, I'm not a political scientist. These things depend on political history, decisions that politicians and governments made at different points in history over many decades. This is not about one particular government or one particular party or one particular election cycle. These are processes which have taken decades to kind of develop and evolve. Um, and there are just so many different reasons at different times for different circumstances. It's very hard to put a finger on it. I mean, I often hear in the press people talking about cultural differences. People don't want this. I tend to be more sanguine on these issues. My view is, well, for example, the city region devolution that we've got, the mayoral type authorities. Um, you know, I, I, I tend to be in favor of that very much. I think they're too small with far too limited powers, but I think the principle is broadly a good one, with no question. That, that is very much how I feel. But the, the, you know, before these elections, lots of people thought, why are we doing this? This is another thing, taxpayers' money, another layer of bureaucracy. But that shifted very fast. You know, people actually are developing real pride in their city region there. Uh, and we see this from a lot of survey data, and that's independent of where you are in the country, or which party happens to be associated with the mayor that you're, you're living under. That, almost independent, people have a strong sense of pride that actually this is a model that can work for us. And I think bottom line is that's what people think about, what can work for us. If it works and they see evidence it's working, people will tend to go on board. Which reinforces the point about good governance, doesn't it? Critical. It's not necessarily Critical. the colour of the government. It's, the and it's not governance. about the government, it's yeah. about governance. Absolutely. Absolutely correct. That's great. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, Christopher Good asks, how can government policy, uh, forward slash, future public sector investment influence the more fair, fair spread of real estate investment? Oh, that's a difficult one, goodness me. Um, I have to be honest, the answer is I don't know, and that's why I'm working on these topics. Yeah. Um, I mean, in the past, we tend to think about kind of relocation of bits of the civil service and so on. I mean, there's still some of those things going on. I don't think they're going to fundamentally change you know, the scale, the, the kind of effects we're talking about, because the scale of these effects. I think that, um, I think bringing planning back into the story is a big part of that. You know, you've got to redevelop places so that they look good and feel good and investors will get interested again. They're not things that can be done in an ad hoc, uncoordinated, fragmented, very localized manner. They need both very local but bigger picture. And I think that's a critical part. So it's all like proactive, direct action planning, you know, in that sense. Well, well, well I mean, again, if you, if you look at cities and places like the Netherlands and Germany, that's exactly the point. And, um, I, I, I used to teach in a university in the Netherlands, and we had a master's program on uh, infrastructure and environmental planning. And I, I would open my classes to that course and say, you know, we don't have, any, we don't have a spatial plan in the UK. And the students would all start laughing because they think it's a joke. And then I wait till they stop laughing. I say, actually, you know, that's true. And they're completely stunned. Because if anyone knows the Dutch, the Dutch plan everything. I mean, the country couldn't exist yeah. without planning. And so it, it's a way of life for them in terms of land use planning. And it, of course, the, 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 the clue is infrastructure and environmental planning. It's all part of the same issue. For them, it's a natural way of thinking and being. When I say we don't do that, then they have no concept of, they're, they're, well, what do you do then? They, they, you know, they have questions like that. So what precisely do you do? Yeah, feels like hoping for the best, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we've got time for one more, one more question from Leslie Martin. In the light of what's been said, how would you assess the potential of a levelling up commission led by Andy Haldane to make a difference to inequality? Well, uh, the, the way I got asked this question quite recently, I think it was in a, when I was doing civil servants, or it's part of the Royal Economic Society and Government Economic Service. 
And my answer was, the people who, who've been really handed the, the top roles in this are Andy Haldane and Neil O'Brien. As far as I'm concerned, Neil O'Brien is probably more literate on these issues than anyone else in, in Parliament, certainly in, in the House of Commons. Mm. And he's been thinking about these things for a long, long time, long before he became a member of Parliament. And of course, Andy Haldane has been speaking publicly with tremendous authority on these issues for quite a long time, as many people know, in his various public lectures. So the fact that the, you know, people of that caliber have been given this responsibility to lead it gives me real hope. Now, how that translates more broadly in terms of other politicians and so on, I don't know, that's politics, that's, that's always the case. But in, in terms of the people at the top who are working on these things, you, know, you couldn't pick better people in the country. I mean, and so that gives me real optimism. That's fantastic, thank you. Hope, I like the sound of that, absolutely. The sound of hope. Have we got time for one more question? One more question. Okay. Right, fantastic. Um, I suppose it's, it's 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 kind of in conclusion from me. I suppose because we've we've run out of ones from the from the thing. Um, bedtime reading. What should people go home ah, and have a look at now, following on from today? Because I always think with these things, you know, you see it, you get really excited. It's like the next steps. You know, what, what should we all look at and then talk to our friends about in a week's time? Like a book club. Okay, so the issue is so complicated. As I say, I've worked on these types of problems for 30 years. This is all my career is this type of stuff in different countries. Um, it took me 10 years to put together the argument completely. And I managed to synthesize it into 570 pages. Ah, it's a book plug, here we go. So <laughs> I do have a book on the subject. It's called The UK Regional National Economic Problem. And it is the book actually that most of the people in Parliament who work in this area in the civil service, they refer to it all the time. I tell people, read chapter one. It's about 35 pages long, and that will explain the whole problem. And then read the last 10 or 15 pages of the book. Because the two together, I think, are probably the most succinct explanation and characterization of the problem. I mean, I'm not encouraging people to buy the book just to help me pay my mortgage. I'm being serious. You know, it, it is very complex, but I think if you read chapter one of the book and the last short chapter at the end, hopefully that gives you the articulation of the nature of the problem. Three things coming together. The peculiar geography of the UK, the asymmetric, the differential shocks of globalization on UK regions, and the particular characteristics of our governance system have interacted in very, very strange and very particular ways. And that's the challenge we face. Given the hand we've got, how do we move forward? Fantastic. With hope and courage. No, I'm so, an optimist. Yeah, yeah. Well, so am I. I'm optimistic. Optimistic Wednesday. That's it. That's it. That's good. Fantastic. Right. Um, we did, can't do the applause uh, online because we can't hear you, but I'm sure you'll all be clapping. So I'm going to start the, the round of applause which you can hear resounding across the UK. Thank you very much, Philip, for your inspiring talk. Um, it's fantastic. I love it. It's like when you go to the car showroom, you look under the hood and you go, oh, it's got a really good engine as well, you know. So, you know, all this stuff that's happening in our towns and cities actually has some logic behind it. And I think we understand the logic, we can actually understand how to mend it as well. So I would thank you very much. Thank you to everybody who's attended this 11th Nathaniel Litchfield uh, lecture this year. Uh, and we hope to see you next year. And uh, have a great evening. Thank you. <laughs>